We are very, very fortunate to have Dr. Joseph Silk, who's a foremost expert on cosmology here, uh, to give us our colloquium. Um, he did his undergraduate uh, in mathematics at Cambridge uh, before moving on to Harvard to get his PhD. Uh, he then took a post at uh, Berkeley, where he was chair for many years. Uh, in fact, it was 30 years at Berkeley before moving to Oxford, where he was also chair for many years. Uh, he's currently professor of physics at the uh, Astrophysics Institute in Paris. Sorry, I can't say that in the French. Uh, and he has a joint appointment at Johns Hopkins University uh, every fall, which is why we are lucky to have him today. Uh, he's a fellow of the Royal Society. He won the 2011 Bolzan Prize for his work on the early universe. Uh, he has a quite extensive Wikipedia page. Um, he's known for an effect called the silk damping. Um, and according to that Wikipedia page, over 500 total publications, but NASA Astrophysics Data System says over 800. Uh, 40,000 citations, 20 nature papers. I could continue, but you probably won't actually hear him speak. So without further ado, uh, the limits of cosmology. OK. Thanks, Aline. Thanks for the invitation to come here. Um, it's a beautiful area, actually. I, the only, you know, I've often driven by and gone to the airport. This is my first time to see a little, in a little part of Baltimore County. I, I'm impressed by the greenness, actually. Okay, and the university seems just uh, great too. Anyway, I'm going to tell you about how far we can go in cosmology, um, what the big questions are, and what the future might be. So let me um, begin, see if this works. Okay, um, so we've made enormous amounts of progress um, since um, the discovery of the expansion of the universe um, in the 1920s. Uh, you can say, you know, w when I began in cosmology, um, we didn't know most of the numbers to within a factor of two. We debated what the density of the universe was to to 50% or even a factor of 10, actually. Um, now, it's a precision science. What we're dealing with 1% um, accuracy, as I'm going to try to t t tell you. But we, we have certain big questions which have been with us for a very long time, and we still haven't got the answer. So one of them is um, dark matter. Um, we are pretty sure it's there. Um, I would say we're very sure it's there, but we haven't identified it. Um, dark energy, which um, uh, is also known as Einstein's cosmological constant, um, and we have questions about um, why it should be a constant, but so far we've seen no deviations from what Einstein predicted a long time ago. Um, and where do we come from? Inflation is our best theory of the beginning of the universe, um, but so far we have not been able to confirm it. Okay, so that sort of sets the ground a bit. Um, dark matter, just to summarize, um, the first uh, part of the story began in around 1930, 1933 actually, um, with Fritz Vicky. I don't know how good your German is, but this is Das Dunkle Materia, a German for dark matter, which he found, deduced, was present in a cluster of galaxies um, by the fact that the measured velocities of the galaxies indicated that you would fly apart within a relatively short time, ex unless there were dark matter keeping them um, gravitationally uh, clustered together. Um, so that was his argument uh, in 1933, and remarkably, we've been able to um, make that much more precise um, with other techniques, modern, and his numbers are still correct. So that's a cluster of galaxies, scale of millions of parsecs. On the galactic scale, um, we also have discovered lots of dark matter. Um, it began um, really with the pioneering work of Vera Rubin, who who died recently, um, but she was um, rare um, in the 1950s, female astronomer. Um, the mountaintop facilities where she did her observations were not really designed uh, to have women astronomers, so uh, all the restrooms were at the base of the mountain, etc. She had to go down after a night of observing to, to sleep and then come back to develop her plates, etc. during the day. It was a long story. We've gotten over that since in astronomy, but that was the story then. So she found that when she looked at this galaxy, the nearest large one to us, Andromeda, the motions of the stars denoted by these 
by these points kept on increasing even though the galaxy seemed to peter out of stars. Um, and this work was really confirmed in radio astronomy um, by using the motions of the gas clouds um, measuring the 21 centimeter line of atomic hydrogen um, by this gentleman and others who found the losses kept on going, meaning that the gravity from the stars is not sufficient to explain the motions of these test particles. And and so dark matter is needed. Um, this is a way of summarizing it. This is uh, what you expect from the stars you see as you go from the center of the galaxy um, outwards. And what you observe is something much more. This difference of order of factor of 10 in matter is what we call dark matter. So, um, and we've since seen this now for vast numbers of galaxies. This is a whole range of them. You see, this is what we call the rotation curve of the galaxy, the orbits of the, of the stars, just not decreasing at all as you go far from the galaxy, telling you there's lots of unseen matter in the outer parts of galaxies, hundreds, thousands of light years away from the center. Okay, um, so switching, jumping forward to the modern era, why we're entirely convinced now, um, almost all of us in the field, that there is dark matter, this was a prediction of Einstein's that um, the presence of matter should c affect the bend light, basically, bend light rays. And so we call this from the gravitational lens. And so here is the measurement, uh, the, the principle, first of all. So here is, you know, we're looking at a telescope, um, and we're looking at this galaxy over here, and here's a big something thing in the way, a cluster of galaxies in this case, but full of dark matter, full of any, you know, stuff that bends light anyway. And so instead of, so not only does some of the light rays come to us, but a light ray in this direction would be bent by the force of gravity, okay? And so we'd see, and if you project this in the sky, you'd see a circle, right? And this amazingly is a beautiful example with the Hubble telescope of a gravitational lens. Okay, so here is, here's the galaxy and the, uh, the, the, which is, doing the bending of the light, the dark matter in this galaxy, and we know it's dark matter because we need more matter than we see in the stars to do this. And this is the background galaxy far away, which you see with this distorted image. So this is the proof that, um, the ultimate proof, we can map dark matter basically on the sky now. That's sort of amazing. Okay, so um, to summarize the, the, the budget of the universe, um, the stuff that we're made of is in this, tiny wedge over here, this is ordinary matter, um, there's at least five times as much invisible matter, and I'll mention this as we go along, another part of the universe, which we call dark energy, also has an equivalent mass density, that's about 70%, and that's also not well known. Um, but um, we're pretty sure that all this stuff exists, so let me now give you um, the best theory that we have for what the dark matter is. So first of all, we think it's a particle because there's a very elegant theory um, that um, predicts very weakly interacting particles in enough number to be the dark matter. So there's a theoretical motivation um, for this. And that comes from a theory called supersymmetry, which says at the beginning there are equal numbers of fermions and bosons at very, very high energy. They must cool down and we're left over. And we know that's not true now. Um, you know, it's very asymmetric. And fermions and bosons have very different properties now. But at the beginning, everything was united. And, and so, and the, uh, and so as the universe cooled down, we're left with the least, all these particles disappear except the ones that we have now. But of these new particles, there's one left over, uh, we're very weakly interacting, which is uh, an ideal dark matter candidate. And so I've tried to sketch its effect over here. Um, all these particles at high energy, they uh, were produced from radiation, the ra and then they annihilated. And as the universe cooled down, we were left with a relic number. And if the, this freeze out process, we call it, if it was too strong a process, there'd be nothing left over. Too weak a process, too much left over. And so it's a bit like Goldilocks. If it's just right, then you get exactly the dark matter from these leftover particles. And the amazing part of the story is that if these particles have weak-like interactions for particles that would not be visible at all in making stars or whatever, then that can be the dark matter. And so this is sort of a natural theory. And the theory actually predicts the, not only the, you know, the interaction strength of these particles. So we, in a sense, we know these particles are there. They interact very, very weakly. Um, this interaction rate is many, many times less than that of ordinary protons. 
but we have to look for it. In principle, they should be passing through us. There are thousands passing through you in this room every second, but how do we detect them? Okay, so um, we have to devise dramatic experiments. And so I'll show you the experiments that we devised to look for these particles. So basically, um, uh, this mysterious particle is the X particle. You can imagine it scattering off a proton, okay? Um, as it comes through your detector, okay? And so we call this process direct detection. And to w make this work, we have to go deep underground, avoid all the cosmic rays, have very purified materials, and I'll show you examples in a second. So that's one approach. Um, here's another approach. Um, the particles, um, the dark matter particles, are what we call their own antiparticles, their Maroni particles. And so in the depths of space, they occasionally find another one. And when they do so, they annihilate. And because they're massive particles, they can give you rare things like high energy gamma, gamma rays or cosmic rays. So our telescopes that look for gamma rays can look for evidence of dark matter. If you see a weak glow in the galaxy, that could be due to, or something else. You have to eliminate the something else, of course. And then finally, you go to um, a big particle collider, okay? The biggest we ha one we have now is in, uh, in Geneva, uh, and you bang protons together, and rarely you'll produce a pair of dark matter particles. Okay, so that's, th that's the techniques we use. And so here then are these experiments in action. Okay, deep underground, um, tons and tons of liquid xenon in this detector, okay? Several kilometers below the surface. Um, uh, a, a telescope for gamma rays in space, a weird one on the ground in South Africa, and CERN, um, uh, uh, some you know, 50, 25 kilometers in, in, in diameter or so in, in Geneva, okay, a tunnel underground, colliding particles together in different directions. Okay, so all of that is what we're doing. In the direct detection case, this is, this is a, you know, a truly international effort. So this shows you all the current experiments ongoing now, often with, in deep underground in mines, with huge mountains over them, because you have to shield your detector from the cosmic rays from the, uh, for, in the Earth's atmosphere. And so the, the deepest one to date is two and a half kilometers below the surface um, in China, and then we have um, the US National Lab in South, South Dakota, and, and, and many others all over the place. Okay. Okay, um, so um, this is a summary of all the results to date from these experiments. And all I want to take you away from this is that on this curve, you have the solid lines are where we are now. This is the, the cross section and the mass of the particle. We're trying to set limits on this from interactions. And the dashed lines are where we're going in the future. So now we're up to tons of liquid xenon. We're building 10 tons. We'll eventually, in a few years, have 100 tons. The more detected material, the better your limits are. And the point of the story is that this yellow line is the absolute basement. We cannot go any further. That's the final frontier detection, because these are neutrinos from the Earth's atmosphere from the Sun, which coherently interact in your detector and give you spurious signals that you can never distinguish from dark matter. So it's a bit frustrating. Um, we have lots and lots of parameter space still to fill. So far we've found nothing. It's getting more and more expensive, but we'll soon, in a few years, reach the limit of what we can do. Um, and as for indirect detection, um, uh, that got a lot of excitement a few years ago because in the center of our galaxy, the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope found an excess of gamma rays. So th this black line is the galactic plane masked out, uh, and behind it you see this glow, and this glow is also the residue after you take out all the known gamma ray sources. And so, and of course, in the center of the galaxy, that's where lots of dark matter collects. And so people said for a while, well, maybe the dark matter really is this supersymmetric relic, okay, annihilating with itself, okay, and this could be what we're seeing. It looked very promising. And the most recent studies from the satellite for them have shown that really there are lots of weak sources there, and probably these are astrophysical sources. The success is not due to dark matter at all. That's too bad. And then... Um, um, uh, we also have been looking at galaxies, very faint galaxies near us. These are thought to be full of dark matter from the stellar motions. Again, no excess gamma rays are seen, no evidence of dark matter. And then finally, um, smashing particles together at CERN, nothing exotic seen so far. Okay, so um, this is... Um, a little bit of a problem, okay? We're in a crisis. Now, one response is that, you know, supersymmetry, this simple theory that gave you an elegant prediction, we found no evidence for it whatsoever. Um, this means that either we should be looking at much higher energy or 
you know, building bigger and bigger colliders. There's a huge move on now to try to build a collider much more powerful than the 10 TV collider at CERN, 100 TV collider. Uh, the CERN collider costs, I think, seven or eight billion dollars. As you go up by 10 times in mass, that's 10 times more expensive. We're up to 100 billion dollars. Uh, it's not such an incredible sum um, to do science with, but you can see we, when, when he's reaching, you know, your financial limits, let, let alone uh, the, you know, you have to balance that with the prospect of finding something new, so that's a whole story. But you have to think about, well, you know, what, what if we don't find find our elusive dark matter? What do we do next? Okay. And so one solution that um, is being actively considered by people is that Einstein is simply wrong. You know, maybe uh, Einstein's theory, which uh, Newton, you know, Newton-Einstein gravity, which is the evidence for the dark matter, maybe there's some other theory out there which, which can invent this weird acceleration without n needing a new particle. So this is the landscape of all of these possible theories today. Um, I won't go into any details. It's based on the notion of having a metric theory of gravity. And you can see there are many, many theories. And they're all, the one thing you can say about these theories in general is, first of all, many of them have um, ra rather nasty things called ghosts in them or singularities of some sort where they're not attractive. But that's a question of working harder on them. And secondly, they're all rather ugly. They're much more complicated than Einstein's theory, which is really a very elegant and simple theory compared to these others. So that could be one direction to go, except we haven't got the answer yet. Um, and then the other direction is really another amazing direction too. So this is the total parameter space of all possible particles that could be dark matter, okay? And I want you to just note, these are, this is a log scale, okay? So this is the mass of the hypothetical particle. This is interaction strength, okay? So we have just searched this very tiny region for these supersymmetric relics, okay? Which we sometimes call neutralinos. Um, but look, there are many, many decades. Um, you can go up to particles which, you know, weigh um, the Planck mass, basically a millionth of a gram, tiny particles which may, which weigh almost nothing, basically. All this parameter space has to be, could be searched, and there are models out there. Now, we haven't found the conventional, you know, supersymmetric model. We, we, people are, so there's no end of work to do. So if you're clever, you think of a new experiment um, to search some new corner parameter space, you apply to the agency, you'll get funding, etc. There are whole careers, many, many careers being developed in the dark matter community this way. Okay. Um, so, um, but that's that's the future, okay, for dark matter, and 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 let me tell you now about the astrophysical side of this, okay, the the, the cosmology side. So he, here's a galaxy as seen um, with um, uh, an infrared telescope, and here's a galaxy as seen with a computer, okay. So uh, same galaxy. Um, the main difference you see is that this is only dark matter. This this is dark matter which you can't see, plus all the stars and all the complicated physics, presumably that's made the stars and we're not really able to do that to this simulation, but what I want to show you is basically there's a big central lump of dark matter, which is, you can't see directly, but we expect it to be there, but there are all these many smaller lumps, and all of these should be dwarf galaxies. And you'll notice small that we see, you know, one or, you know, very, very few small, almost none actually around this galaxy. Our Milky Way has got a dozen or so. Um, with a few very small ones as well. Um, okay, so there's something funny going on here too, okay? The, 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 the theory of dark matter, not only have we found the dark matter, but it seems to predict there should be things out there that we don't see. This is another reason for um, my colleagues saying there's a, 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 a what they call a small scale crisis in cosmology, which I don't believe in, and I'll try to explain why. Um, and so uh, we have a problem for dwarf galaxies, and, and you have to choose between particle physics and astrophysics. Um, we haven't found the particles yet, but you can imagine there are particles out there in this enormous parameter space that would solve these problems, that would be interacting enough with each other strongly, so you wouldn't have a dwarf galaxy problem. So that's one, one, one attitude. Or you can imagine there's a type of dark matter, which I've given the, the acronym PBH, which stands for primordial black hole, something totally, totally weird. I'll have to tell you a little about that. But also left over from the beginning of the universe, th this could be dark matter too. And these you probably wouldn't see in your particle detectors because, you know, it's like having an asteroid fall at you or something. Um, it, it's rather rare, but they, they could be out there in space 
tiny black holes, not, not so tiny black holes, and be the dark matter. We think that's an option. Okay. Anyway, um, why is the particle solution thought to be effective? So this this, this is um, data. These these lines are data on the rotation of small galaxies, and so the black lines are the standard cold dark matter, ordinary dark matter fit. Um, that I've talked about, and it simply is, is a disaster. So you, you make too many satellites, but in detail here, you get the rotation curve, which is a, a very, you know, counting numbers of small objects is a dangerous thing to do because you may miss them, but measuring the rotation of a galaxy is something very precise. And you can see that the black line, um, which is the prediction of the standard simple dark matter particles in the canonical theory fails disastrously. And only if you go to a very exotic model of dark matter, in which the dark matter basically interacts with itself, strongly scatters, and so in, the, the small things simply don't form because of viscous effects, can you get a model that fits. So you're left with a question, you know, do I invent new particle physics, or maybe there's some clever thing that we haven't come across yet in astrophysics? And the story goes on with other examples. So here's another example. Um, what we're measuring now um, uh, at very high redshift, so this is the a measure of distance in the universe, uh, these objects which are massive black holes, very massive black holes. And this is their mass. They're billions of solar masses. So these are amazing things too. Big monsters and galaxies, billions of solar masses. So you have to ask the question, how are they made? Okay? And we think they're made from smaller black holes. Smaller black holes grow by accretion. And so in this picture, you attempt to extrapolate whatever they were made of back in time. And you find that when you go back to early times, you still need, you know, significant black holes there in the universe to make the big ones that we see with our big telescopes uh, slightly later. And again, we have no idea where these seed black holes come from. And um, one big debate that goes on is that maybe they are there from the beginning of the universe. And if so, they could be the dark matter as well, if there are enough of them. We just see a few in the quasars. Okay. And then um, going on, um, there are other stories to do with dwarf galaxies that we should be seeing, many that we don't see, let me skip that. Um, and, then, um, and, and then weird galaxies that are very dwarfs that are very, very hard to explain with conventional astrophysics or even with dark matter. So the, the problem that we have now is you can't invent a dark matter particle to solve all of the, you, you, you fine tune your new physics if you want to think it's particle physics, and you solve one problem, but then you find these other problems, two of which I haven't ex even explained to you, that are unsolved. So you have to be very selective. It's, it's a very unsatisfactory way to go. So maybe the answer is some new astrophysics, okay? And so what is the new astrophysics? Um, let me tell you what that is. Um, that is um, inventing black holes there from the beginning of the universe, which are the centers of all these galaxies, and they can do dramatic things. And so why do black holes do dramatic things? So as a galaxy forms now, and they have these early black holes sitting there in the universe, and the galaxy, it's a center of gravity, the galaxy forms around it. So our galaxy's got a black hole in the middle, the Milky Way, a four million solar mass black hole. Um, we don't know anything about the dwarf galaxies. They could have black holes, and we do not know. But this is what we think happens for big galaxies, that the black hole basically accretes gas, and then the gas heats up in the extreme gravity of the black hole and then blows everything else out and we call this feedback and basically this can make a big galaxy essentially stop forming stars because you've chased the gas away and explained the ones that we see and if this happened in a small galaxy it would be disaster you'd ruin everything and you'd quench it completely so all you'd have left would be the black hole and possibly the dark matter around it. So that's the sort of thing we think might happen. And um, when you try to do simulations of the universe, I'm not going to say much about these because, you know, you're trying to put the universe on a computer. This is a model of the Milky Way galaxy and all of these dots are black holes. Um, in, the, in this computer model, okay? They're the leftover black holes from that, as the galaxy assembled out of small galaxies, everything fell together, all the gas made stars, but you're left with a whole lot of black holes. And those could be some large part of the dark matter for a wiener. Okay, um, so this is the choice we have. Um, do we go for something um, really exotic for dark matter? Um, you have to bear in mind that 
you know, these are extraordinary claims you want to change particle physics, um, and you need extraordinary evidence. So the evidence that I've shown you for weird, for explaining rotation curves and properties of dwarf galaxies, the numbers of them, is that good enough to justify changing fundamental physics? That's the debate that we have at the moment. Some people think it is. Uh, I personally do not. Um, and, and these are different types of dark matter that people have been inventing. Um, they call it warm dark matter. There's this weird, highly interacting dark matter. There's another dark matter called fuzzy. I don't want to explain that now, but the, so this is the sort of physics you go into. And if you put in black holes, because they have such incredible astrophysical impact on their surroundings, they can certainly do the job as well. Okay, so this is a pitch really for black holes everywhere in the universe, and maybe there's some part of the dark matter, maybe only a small part, maybe something. Okay. Um, so, um, just to finish the black hole story, give you a little more on that, uh, these are the black holes that we know about, these two peaks here. So, stars, ordinary stars, make black holes. The massive stars do. And the way that happens is I have a pair of stars, one of them collapses to make a black hole, its binary companion gas accretes onto it, hot x-rays, we measure this, we measure the binary, we can compute the mass, we measure black holes in the Milky Way this way. Okay, so these are black holes of tens or hundreds of solar masses. In the quasars, we measure these monster black holes, hundreds of millions of solar masses, okay? There's one at the center of this galaxy, for example, which we measure from the speed up of the motions of the stars, but in general, quasars, where the gas really heats and glows and emits radio jets and all sorts of weird things, those are big black holes too. In the, mi in the middle, we know nothing, okay? And so the conjecture is that you maybe you have lots of what we call intermediate mass black holes, which might come from the beginning of the universe, maybe, okay. Okay, and as I said, you know, th there's no evidence for this yet, or very little. It's a bit like, you know, inspecting the scene of a crime. We're seeing all this debris, all, all these hints that our standard model isn't working properly for dark matter, so why not go for something um, uh, that we, that plausibly may be there, uh, that's purely astrophysical, it's not inventing new physics, uh, that might be black holes. So, why, yep. so we, we detect the supermassive black holes and then the X-ray binary the smaller black holes, why would there be a gap? Why would we observe? The gap could be completely full, filled. Yeah, yeah it would be filled, but why wouldn't we have observed it if we observed it? Uh, because it's very hard to observe. I mean, let me just explain why it's hard to observe. So measuring these black holes in the, the, the small galaxies are have so few stars and you can't do the standard tests that you do with the big galaxies. And only recently have we begun seeing X-ray sources in the dwarf galaxies, and we now see some fraction do indeed have black holes. So we are beginning to see them. And we don't know what fraction the total number of black holes is because we just see the ones that are lit up. So, you know, it's a big mystery at the moment. So, why do we think there are, that dark matter could be black holes? So, here is the recent story on that, um, an experiment called LIGO, which measured gravity, gravity waves for the first time and detected black holes, uh, as now running, um, and it detects black holes by gravitational radiation from the merging of two black holes. So from the gravity wave signal, they can measure the mass of the black hole. And so here are the masses of the black holes measured to date. Okay, so this is the in solar masses. So the first events they saw um, were, there was a 60 solar mass being, black hole being formed by two 30 solar mass black holes. And these are some of the other masses we're seeing. And so this was a big surprise two years ago because all of the X-ray studies, the ones that had measured black holes before by indirect means, okay, found smaller masses. So people began speculating. It didn't take long before they were able to fine-tune their models and make bigger black holes from merging stars. But also people suggested that they could be primordial black holes. They were unexpectedly big. They could be these missing regime of black holes that we haven't found yet coming together, merging, give me gravi giving gravity wave signals. There's a big question mark. We don't know which is true, okay? And, um, and so you, you can argue, you know, is this possible or not? And so these are experimental limits on, on these black holes. Just to show you some, an example here. So it, it, in any, over some mass, mass range from 
the mass of the sun to 10,000. You can use various constraints, mostly from lensing, gravitational lensing, to set limits on the mass fraction of, of the dark matter in the black holes. And we, and we know there are tiny windows available where I would say maybe 10% of the dark matter could be in these black holes. But if you add things up over this full range, then most of it could be. So we're at the situation now where life is getting interesting. We can apply many astrophysical tests to look for black holes from indirect types of astronomy arguments. And the jury really is out on what fraction they make. It could be 10%, it could be 1%, but some part of the dark matter might be black holes and they might have these really interesting astrophysical uh, signatures. Okay. Um, anyway, so now let me get in to um, the main part of my talk, okay? I've tried to set things up for you with the dark matter story, and I'm just going to use that as an example now to tell you about the real problem in cosmology, okay? So here is, for example, um, the possible uh, range where you might make black holes in, in terms of the early universe. I won't explain the details, but the microwave background sets limits, but on the very small scales we have essentially complete freedom in postulating enough fluctuations in the beginning is the measure of initial fluctuations to form primordial black holes. So the property of the early universe, initial conditions, at, at the epoch of inflation, actually. Okay. Um, right. So let's move on to dark energy. Um, this was discovered um, about a decade ago, um, um, actually nearly two decades ago, because there was a bright star an exploding star in a distant galaxy, the supernova, and it was found to be uh, much dimmer than expected. And that dimness was interpreted to be due to the expansion and acceleration of the universe. So the galaxy was further away than it was in the standard model. And so this led to the, um, to the notion of um, dark energy, basically. And so dark energy, um, if uh, in Einstein's uh, fundamental you know, field equations, you have um, but basically gravity curves space, that this is the curvature of space, and you have a source of mass and energy which are responsible for that. And Einstein, when went beyond this to say, because he didn't know about the expansion of the universe, he added this lambda term to balance this and stop the universe collapsing. Um, he later regretted that, of course, but now uh, it's, it, the monster has come back to haunt us and we now put it as an extra source of, of, to combat um, gravity and anti-gravity, and this is what accelerates the universe. Okay, and it's equivalent to having, if you like, a, ne a negative pressure. Okay, so that's that's essentially what lam how lambda Einstein's lambda is interpreted uh, as, as a negative form of mass energy density, which acts as anti gravity and can cause acceleration. Okay, um, so it's interesting that um, Lemaitre, um, who was really the founder of along with Hubble, I suppose, of the expanding universe cosmology in, in the sense of comparing observations and, and theory. Um, he was aware as early as 1933 um, that um, he could think of negative pressure as giving him the cosmological constant of Einstein, which is this anti-gravity. So it's not a recent concept at all, it goes back a very long way. Okay, um, and then the acceleration of the universe, um, Hubble's law. Um, um, the, amazingly, the, re the region of parameter space that Hubble, you know, this is, you know, velocity and distance, right? And Hubble just looked in this tiny local region, and all the modern data gives you this expansion with this slight deviation, which is the acceleration of the universe. And amazingly, Lemaitre came up with um, exactly the same reasoning as Hubble um, uh, two years before Hubble published. Um, but because Lemaitre made the mistake of publishing in French, uh, his work was not recognized till after Hubble. And we still call it the Hubble law, although perhaps it should be the Hubble-Lemaitre law. Anyway, the question is, that's where we are now. We've measured this deviation from the Hubble law, the expansion, and the question is where do we get next in cosmology? So this is where we were in 2001. This is the matter density and this is the dark energy density. And we're trying to measure these things astrophysically um, and to decide, you know, does dark energy dominate the universe or, or what, whatever. And you see, so quite early on, we realized that dark matter was less than 50% and dark energy was more than 50%. And these are different observations. Here's the supernova observations and the, this is the microwave background 
or basically zeroing in on trying to constrain the parameter space. So, um, and you can do the same thing um, um, uh, 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 now. And you notice you have a much tinier area. With all the modern data, we've zeroed in, and we now conclude that, you know, the universe is going to be 70, is 70% 70 dark energy and about 30% matter. So that's where we are today, 2017. Then where do we go in the future? Um, so if you now project um, into the future, um, we're now thinking of going to you know, much more dramatic, expensive experiments. And this is where we'll be um, in the next few years. We'll, we'll have zeroed in over here, you know, um, zeroed in over here, but we have no prediction of exactly where to go, okay? We don't know how accurately you ever want to measure this. Right now, we're talking about a few percent accuracy. In the next few years, it'll get down to 1%, but the qu question you have to ask is where, where do you stop? And so here are all the big telescopes that we're planning to basically make dark energy more precise. Um, the European uh, extremely large, a 40 meter, almost 40 meter telescope, LSST um, um, uh, in, in the US, the 30 meter telescope, somewhere stuck in Hawaii politics for the moment, another space arrays, etc. All of these designed to look and, uh, uh, in other wavelengths too. Okay. Um, Right, so I want now to, to give you a picture of a more precise goal in cosmology, okay, what we can somehow do that's, that's a little better than this. So I have to say a word or two about why the universe um, accelerates, and it's very similar actually to the theory of inflation, which is very important because that explains why the universe is as big as it is. It went through an enormous acceleration once upon a time. And so, um, without getting into very de details, A is the scale factor of the universe, and in order to have acceleration, the acceleration must be positive, okay? And the way you do that um, is by, so this is the F Freeman's famous equation in which the universe decelerates for positive density and pressure, but if I have negative pressure, the hundred constant, then I can get acceleration. And this happened for a certain amount of time very early on at the beginning when inflation occurred, uh, this this very simple change in the early equation of state. Um, so, And this is when it occurred, um, a tenth of minus 36 seconds after the Big Bang, um, the theory of inflation says there was a, dr a dramatic uh, inflation period which, which stopped very soon, and the universe then quiescently expanded, made structure, and here we are today. So that is, that is the sort of the modern view of cosmology, but you have to take this as, as, a, as a hypothesis. Um, and the intriguing thing, of course, is that, you know, the same um, rapid exponential acceleration that occurred then is beginning to occur now with the cosmic constant, and we'd like to understand all of this much better. Okay, so why is inflation such a accepted by many cosmologists it because it made three incredible predictions. It tells us why space is very close to Euclidean space, why the three angles of a triangle are up to 100 degrees. Um, it tells us why this is so enormous. It also, um, because it's at the intersection of the quantum theory and gravity, explains the tiny fluctuations from which all structure began. Um, and in some sense, all of these things have been confirmed. Uh, and most amazingly, um, with the, um, the Planck satellite in the microwave background, we've measured these tiny fluctuations, and we can e explain this with a very, very simple phenomenological model, which are essentially these, um, these fluctuations, which are formed early on. And here you can see why, where the fluctuations come from. Amazingly, in, in the old theory of the universe, here we have the expanded speed of light, Here's the mass within a galaxy today, track it back in time. When I go back to a certain time, it was bigger than the light travel time across the universe, which makes no sense at all. It means that you have to appeal to some creator to lay down the fluctuations. But thanks to inflation, you know, quantum theory can do the job very nicely. So that's why it's so appealing, okay? Um, but the problem is that... Um, uh, while most of my colleagues trust inflation, there's a, a loud minority that does not, that says we have to prove it. Okay, so the way we can prove it, um, there are basically two 
possibilities. One is that inflation um, generated um, a huge background of gravity waves. Okay? Now, we can't see these directly because their redshift is an incredibly low frequency. Their wavelength is you know, billions of years. But they do give you a polarization twist in the microwave background. Okay? And so that you can look for. Um, and the second thing they do at some also very, very weak level is they give you a certain element of non-Gaussianity, non-randomness in any large-scale fluctuations you can hope to see in the universe when the microwave background or in anything else. Okay? So those are, those are the two channels that we try to look for. Okay, um, so the first question is, where, what do we do then in cosmology? So um, one uh, big quest now is to look for this polarization. And the problem is the theory, we have this amazing map of the fluctuations, but now we're going to look for the polarized component, which is very tricky, but we have no prediction as to what that should be. And this shows you why it's such a difficult experiment. So we're looking for, you know, th these are the fluctuations. And if I have um, dust in the universe, that basically um, can give me a polarization, the rate radiation is scattered by it, and it can give me this, this type of polarization, um, which is due to a, a compressional motion, we call this an E-mode, or a more vortical motion, these are two types of polarization, um, and, and so this, this is the dominant one, mostly by dust, also by gravitational lensing, we, we measure this, it's, you know, it's, we have to do 10 or 100 times better to, than this sensitivity map to get to this, and then finally, even weaker, is any residual component from inflation. Okay, and so um, we have many experiments um, un underway being proposed um, and all sorts of ground-based experiments. Um, uh, this one's at the South Pole, this one's in Atacama in Chile, the, and balloon experiments, space experiments. Uh, and the idea is that in the next decade, they will improve on this map by a factor of 100 and get us down to measuring the polarization. But there's a big problem uh, with all this. Um, first of all, it's incredibly difficult and expensive. So you can see, for example, today with a Planck satellite, we had about 30 detectors on that telescope to get that amazing map. The current flights, experiments, use a thousand little detectors on these telescopes. Um, we're now um, building detectors with tens of thousands, and ultimately we want to go up to half a million detectors. And these are enormous data rates, terabytes per day, um, and that's where we'll be in the mid-20s, okay? to 2030. Those are current plans or hopes with a microwave background designed to get to the, the, the mode of polarization. But there's a big problem in this because we have no prediction as to what it should be. And so you can think of this as, you know, is this the right thing to be doing with so much money and so much effort if we don't have a definite goal in mind? Okay, that, that's the problem. We, we have to look, but at some point you ask the question, what should we expect to see? If we're lucky, We'll find something, and they'll be giving Nobel Prizes, etc. but that's no guarantee of that whatsoever. Okay, so um, I think there is something else you can do is in cosmology, and this is something that is much more difficult and much more futuristic, um, and that's to look for non-Gaussianity, random, non-random patterns on the sky, okay, which inflation must produce at some level. Yep. Um, why is it? Uh, why do you call non-random non Gaussian? I think you put it also earlier. It seems to suggest that you always assume that the randomness or the noise that you see in the universe is somewhat close to an equilibrium, so you can assume a Gaussian distribution. Why is that a fair assumption? Um, that's exactly the, 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 the point that when you go through what you expect from inflation at some level, because you're dealing with maybe the square of a Gaussian or something, there is a deviation when you expand away, f when you put in simple deviations from the simplest model, okay? Th the central limit approximation does say it's purely Gaussian. That's not true. That doesn't apply. Because you, you only have one field, for example, in the simple model of inflation. If you, if you had an infinite number of fields, you'd, you'd be there, but you don't. And you have all the additional fluxes, which means you would actually expect some kind of privilege distribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a very, very small effect. That's the problem for, if you want the guaranteed signal. Okay, that, that's, that's the whole issue. Okay, so, so again, gravity waves are small, not 
quantitative, but you generically get some deviation from Gaussianity. And, um, and basically that's because you're always squaring about potentials. Um, and if you have more complicated models, in particular primary black holes, you get bigger signals. Okay, so all of that is a great thing to look for. So how do you look for this in a way that you cannot do, that you can do better with them, with them, than, than with the microwave background, for example, or even galaxy surveys? So here is the trick. You have to go to the dark ages. Um, that is, um, here we have today. Uh, this is galaxy forming. Um, and this is where we see in the microwave background, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Okay? These are the fluctuations I talked about. Then in between, we have gas clouds combining together to make the first stars. Okay, and so that's this, we call this the dark ages, that's in between uh, what we see in the microwave background and in between galaxy light. And if you could study the universe over here, that might be a way of getting closer to the primordial fluctuations. Okay, and let me show you how you might do that. Okay, um, so what? it's a real challenge because um, you have to do hundreds of times better than we now can do with microwave background satellites to test inflation. And the reason for that is, if you think of um, the microwave background fluctuations, there's a quadratic correction term, which is due to these deviations from Gaussianity, from randomness, okay? And you can prove that, um, uh, in general, this number, okay, um, uh, should be of order 0.03, okay, this number over here. And because it's quadratic in temperature fluctuations, that means, you know, you're talking about really, really small numbers, okay? And so to give you some feeling for this, the current limit from the Planck satellite is 10. So you've got to do, you know, 100 times better or 1,000 times better, maybe, than Planck, okay, than you can with the microwave background. Okay, so the question is, um, is any of that, uh, feasible, okay? And let me show you um, why I think it might be. So what it boils down to is increasing the number of information you can get from the sky. Okay, so with the microwave background, you can just count up the number of patches you have. And this is the beautiful signal that Planck measured from the microwave background. We, we express it in terms of the moments, Fourier moments on the sky. And this corresponds to one degree. This is the 180 degrees over here. And you go to smaller and smaller degrees. And here it all gets very complicated. But where this peaks, um, maybe uh, we begin to see these fluctuations, the remnants of the damping of the fluctuations predicted in the Big Bang. You have maybe a thousand different moments in angle on the sky, that's one number, that means you have a million patches on the sky, one million modes, okay? And then one over the square root of a million is 0.1%, and that's the best you can ever do with micro background cosmology. You'll never do better than 0.1%. So you've got to do a 100 or a 1,000 times better. So how on earth can you increase the number of modes on the sky? So the first thing you might think of doing is go to a big galaxy survey. So the LSST, um, this new telescope being built in Chile will get up to 10 billion galaxies, redshifts, photo redshifts. That's amazing, right? I, I can now suddenly jump from a million to 10 to the 10th. But the difference, 10,000, I have to take the square root of that. So that's, that's amazingly better, but that may not be good enough, especially because galaxies are rather biased objects and I certainly can't use all my 10 billion. So probably the best I can ever do is win a factor of 10 on that. So there's one, one thing you can do, which is, this is the amazing thing. If you can go to the dark ages, then you go to when the galaxies were built up from all these hydrogen clouds. Here's the galaxy today. And the typical mass of these clouds is a million solar masses, so I have a million per galaxy. So suddenly, instead of having, you know, a billion galaxies, I now can have some enormous number of clouds, if I could measure those clouds. If I could treat them as my independent passion on the sky, I could suddenly do amazing cosmology. Okay, so um, you could get much, much bigger ends, and this means, um, in principle, and, and if you do this at 21 centimeters, radio frequency, you can actually slice the sky up and do this in three dimensions, okay, in principle, and win. Okay, so let me show you how this works. Um, so, so here, for example, 
<laughs> this is the micro background, okay? This is the power spectrum. The, these are, the, this is the wave number of the fluctuations. If I can go to the, uh, and this it gets to smaller and smaller scales. This is my limit to 0.1% accuracy. But if I can uncover the dark ages at 21 centimeters at a micro background, I can suddenly go into this regime and go all the way up to much, much smaller scales. This would be arc minute or arc second resolution. Um, and get, you know, enormously more modes. And because I know the frequency at which the spin-flip transition goes in hydrogen to amazing accuracy, right? 21 centimeter frequency. Uh, this is redshift defined by some enormous factor from the early universe, but I have, I can do high precision work. Um, that's, that's the secret of which, of uh, which, this frequency come out at? Yeah, the, so we, it's, oh yeah, yeah, I'll come to that in a second. It's 30 megahertz. It's pretty tough. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. So, so, and the other interesting thing is that, so this is the, the redshift range that you have to look at to get this effect between you know, maybe 30 to 100 or something. So this is a very, very early universe. But here's the thing that you should better take the take-home message. What you're measuring is the spin temperature. This is the this is the sp the spin flip state of hydrogen, and and and, and be because um, the microwave background is has a certain temperature to go back in time because of um, atomic collisions being relatively weak. The spin flip temperature is below the microwave background, so I can see the gas in absorption against the background. So I, in principle, I can look for this transition, look for absorption features, and try to map out the universe in the dark ages. So that's the way it goes. Okay. Um, and um, just, so just to summarize again, you can get a million modes in the microwave background, maybe a hundred million um, with galaxy surveys, and maybe I can get 10 to the 10th with dark ages, and then I can slice the universe up because I know the frequency so well along the life cycle, do three-dimensional work, and, and get you know ten to the twelve, which is in a hundred times better than galaxies, a thousand times better than CMB. Okay, so the gain is enormous, and I have to go to this um, redshift range, ten meter wavelength. That's incredible. That's a simple dipole sort of things use, you know. Uh, but I need a lot of them to build up my sensitivity and to get the angular resolution. So this shows you a simple calculation of of what you need in terms of frequency coverage. Then I'll show you how we might do this. So you need to get these really high high modes. That means arc seconds on the sky it means an enormously big interferometer actually, uh, which you have to fill up with these dipoles. You can estimate what the size might be. So if I have you know um, uh, modes of with 10 to the fifth you know wave wa uh, in wave numbers wave frequencies uh, and a wavelength uh, of, t of 10 meters for the redshift then I need a hundred kilometer telescope enormous telescope okay um, and uh, and that will give me all these patches on the sky for your information the square kilometer array which we're building now for operation in 2025 will have roughly a million dipoles and we'll be able to op operate at 30 megahertz in 2025 but there's a problem with this you may think Think that might get us part of the way there, but the square kilometer array is in Australia, and there's a big thing above it which is called the Earth's ionosphere, and there's another big thing. Even though there are very few people that live nearby, there are all sorts of Earth interference from microwaves, so it's not a very good place to do such low frequency astronomy. Okay, so you need to go somewhere else. Okay, and there is only one place to go, really. I'll, I'll explain that to you. So this is the far side of the moon. This just shows you how difficult it is, all the interference on the Earth, your TV, etc. So the far side of the moon is the one place to go, um, and it's the most radio quiet environment in the inner solar system. Okay, so this is where you want to go. So now practically, how do you do this? What, what, what are we discussing here? Okay, so um, first of all, this is an interferometer. I have many, many antennae. I'm not going to build a single dish. So I have to solve the computing problem, right? I have to correlate the signals from each of these antennae. That is non-trivial. Right now, um, the biggest, most powerful antenna on the Earth does this number of multipliers per second, 10 to 15 per second, a thousand antennas in Canada, 400 megahertz. Okay, so um, this is what we're building in Australia, will build in the next few years. Um, clearly, um, it has a um, hundred times more antennas, so it's going to um, involve uh, far more uh, computing power, but 
to get to the moon with 10 million antennas, you need to improve current computing limits by a million, okay? And the only reason we think this is feasible is thanks to Moore's law, which says that computing power has been doubling historically every year for the past many years, so why shouldn't it keep on going um, for 20 years and then we can get there? So we don't think computing power is, an, is a limitation. Okay, so let me now take you to the moon, okay? And so um, this is a schematic of what we'll do on the far side of the moon. You have a lunar um, ranger, rover, which is going to lay out um, 3D printed um, mylar strips, even people have designed paper strips actually, on which are imprinted dipole antennas, right? And so you lay them out, um, and um, there's a you know, central correlator somewhere, um, and maybe with satellites around the moon to collect the signal. Okay, so that's, that's in principle, 100 kilometers on the far side of the moon is what you might want to do with this, okay? Okay, so... Um, what will you do on the moon? Why is even this worth discussing? Well, it turns out that the space agencies are thinking seriously about going back to the moon, and particularly the European Space Agency. So they have, and NASA too, actually, to some extent. So um, the moon has been surveyed, and especially near the south pole of the moon, you have um, these amazing craters, and one of them is the, is the Shackleton Crater, um, which are in perpetual shadow. Okay, and in fact, uh, the NASA Diviner spacecraft um, imaged this a couple of years ago um, and found temperatures of 25 Kelvin throughout the year in complete darkness, okay, inside some of these creatures near the limb of the moon, near the south pole of the moon, which is basically more, sort of more of a twilight zone. Okay, um, and how do you get power there? Well, the amazing thing about one or two of these craters, Shackleton in particular, is that they have perpetual light as well on the rim around them. So the rim is so high that they get sunlight. Uh, and in fact, there are regions near the South Pole of the Moon which have, you know, normally night is two weeks, day is two weeks, and you, you don't want to run out of power in the night, okay? So what you have to do is find a site where you get perpetual light and perpetual power. So this will be the most valuable real estate on the moon. These areas which have been mapped out and, and you know, when we get to the moon to, to, to try to compete for among different countries who are doing this, right? Anyway, so here we have um, the images um, showing you, 20, you know, down to 25K inside these craters and the rim of the crater in perpetual light. So you can get your power there continuously, and this would be where you'd be build your moon base, and from there you'd send your rovers out across the far side of the moon. And maybe you'd want to put other telescopes there as well, that's a whole other story, but this is the ESA concept for a moon village approximately in 2035. So, so far what they've been talking about are two things, not the word science has barely been mentioned, but it's business and tourism that they want to basically, for their investment on the moon, which is significant, okay? So by business, I think they mostly mean mining. So it turns out that the moon's been bombarded by meteorites for billions of years. There are some very rare stuff on the surface of the moon. Um, there's also an awful lot of helium-3. It doesn't occur naturally on the Earth at all. But thanks to solar cosmic rays, the moon's abundant with helium-3, and that will be the key to thermonuclear fusion uh, technology in the future, in 50 years, everyone thinks, right? So, there are immense resources on the moon. Um, tourism, you can only begin to imagine, that would attract people. But why not, at the same time, you know, encourage the agencies to think a little bit, a bit about doing some science on the moon? And the science will be a very small fraction of the expense of the moon village. Okay, tiny fraction. Okay, so, you know, it's... You know, this may remind you of the space station, all that stuff, right? But anyway, um, th there are things you can imagine doing on the moon. So why the, moon, the moon's a stable platform. It's seismically completely stable, seismologically completely stable, etc. No winds on the moon. You do all sorts of things on the moon that you cannot do on the Earth. Big telescopes topple over on the Earth because of high winds, okay? The biggest you can ever build on the Earth is 40 meters. So on the moon, there are no limits, really, okay? People are now planning inside one of these craters to have a kilometer-sized telescope, okay? or even a 30 kilometer size telescope, consists of many interferometer like ma many dishes, okay, a bit like Arecibo, like, but in the infrared. So, um, and you, it's naturally chilled down for you to 25 Kelvin.
yourself in. So there are incredible things you can do. No atmosphere above you, no limits, no, no need to correct for the seeing, um, no, no windows, no frequency windows. So all that's great. Anyway, so just a yes. Have a magnetic field. Don't you have to worry about cosmic rays? Um, yeah, yeah, you do. But yeah, that's <laughs> sure, yeah. sure. The, 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 yeah, that's a worry that one will have to design through. Okay. Anyway, just to summarize then. Um, so we have a generic prediction from inflation. Um, if you do the microwave background, you're limited to um, a thousand times this number. Galaxy surveys, optical infrared, maybe a hundred. Um, the SKA may do a little bit better, but the far side of the moon will get you there um, in the time frame 2035 to 2040. And maybe there are even some um, weird patterns that you can see predicted by inflation uh, that, you know, in the, in the non-Gaussianity pattern on the moon. And the point is that if you, all you want, if what you want to falsify inflation, um, you have to look for this and show this does not exist. That's one way we can be sure to force inflation. If you don't find the B mode, you will not falsify inflation. You just push yourself into a wide part of parameter space. So we're next in cosmology, dark energy, no predictions really, dark matter, no detection yet, inflation via CMB, no lower bound, primordial non gaussianity I would say is the new frontier. So thank you, that's it. Yes. Uh, first, Wilson also observed the distribution of galaxies and concluded that the force of gravity seems to drop off faster than one over r squared, which would be consistent with a massive graviton. Is that still an anomaly? Is that, um, no, I I, uh, I don't think modern observations support that at all. So uh, no, no. So I don't think it's been re really re revisited much. So. Yeah. That hasn't stopped people working on modified gravities to get rid of dark matter completely, but... Yes? So you just, at the very end, you mentioned uh, a, an experiment that would say, okay, inflation is just no good because this data says, forget it. Is there the same kind of experiment or, or measurement that could be made to say, okay, we have to throw dark matter in the trash can. Um, let's see. Um, I don't know of one. I mean, you could imagine, um, for example, finding a galaxy with a rotation curve that was not flat like the ones I showed you. But people have looked for those and they've found them, and there's always an explanation for that astrophysically. So, and that seems to be true, um, on, that's on the galactic scale. Um, yeah, so I... I think right now the ball is in the other court, that the people who have um, um, theories that without dark matter are trying to have to make their theories plausible. Um, Lorentz invariant, for example, et cetera, et cetera. And that they've completely failed to do. So that's, that. the problem is we have no alternative worth, at this point, I would say worth pursuing. <laughs> yep. If we? Okay, so then um, it, it's, I mean, people, of course, do have other options. Um, um, you know, one of them consists of colliding brains and, uh, you know, leading to uh, some rapid expansion from that injection of energy early on. And um, n none of these other theories, I think, have um, been worked out in as much detail as inflation. They don't make as price, precise predictions. So for now, um, uh, they're, they're on the sidelines, but I'm sure if inflation were falsified, people would, would turn to these other. Yep. Do we, do we know anything about um, how the ratio of primes to dark matter might have evolved? I think at the very beginning of the first second um, article said that there's about 400 times um, more dark matter than prime matter, then it's probably said 10 times or 5 times. Do we know anything how that evolved over? Well, that, that, that depends a lot on um, your theory of converting, um, you know, baryons into, into luminous matter. And the big problem in all of this is that we don't see all of the baryons. There's a deficit. And so most of the baryons, in fact, are, so far haven't been found. In, in they're predicted from helium synthesis, etc. And so because there's that big uncertainty, it's very hard to make 
precise prediction. Nevertheless, there should be a phase, for example, before the first stars formed, when you had very, very high ratios of um, dark to luminous matter. You had almost no luminous matter. You expect to see such things, and that's still controversial. That would be a prediction, for example. So you suggested intermediate, intermediate black holes, intermediate mass black holes could be dark matter. Um, what kind of number densers are we talking about, and why haven't we observed them? Presumably they could produce <laughs> gas or try to disrupt stars. Why are we not seeing them? Okay, so the, exactly those arguments have been looked at, and it's very controversial. So there are papers claiming that they, they would disrupt one or two nearby dwarf galaxies more, um, that, that is allowed by the observations and the counter argument is this particular dwarf galaxy Eridanus 2 I think it's called which would be destroyed if one had black holes of almost any mass being the dark matter they, the uh, counter argument is let, let's put a black hole in the center of it and that, that's like a shield it protects the stars from being disrupted so that's you know, theories are very ingenious so they, they can we can look way out any observation? Well, no, but things like this are testable because in principle, if you argue that dwarf galaxies have black holes in, then that's definitely a hypothesis that, you know, a very precise hypothesis that you can then test. In this particular galaxy, by measuring more dynamics, etc., or others, there are many others to look at. So if you can demonstrate that's valid, then that would be the protection mechanism you need to, yep, for example. Yep. What would be the, like, ratio of, uh, like, of these intermediate black holes? Uh, intermediary mass black holes to the other black holes we know exist. Okay, okay. So, so you know, I think it's pretty clear that you can't just say that because um, the first LIGO event was two thirty solar mass black holes that all the primordial black holes are thirty solar masses. That that almost certainly ruled out. But what you could say is that there's a wide range of primordial black holes, all the way from um, who knows the mass of Mount Everest up to ten thousand thousand solar masses. So you have a, a little each each mass range contributes to dark matter and they're all predicted by this same theory of uh, whatever deviations from fluctuations in the standard inflation model which would give you all the black holes you could possibly need or more okay so you can adjust the theory to give you black holes spread over a very wide range and um, then any individual mass range is much harder to test that's right. uh, this is a little less question. It's like just a few days ago, there was that news that there may have been an intermediate mass black hole detection in our own galaxy. So is that, are we prone to believe the intermediate mass black holes would be made of dark matter, or is it possible that they are also just on the regular matter spectrum? Okay, so of course, when you have a black hole, you never know what it's made of, right? Uh, yeah. And it probably would not have formed from dark matter anyway, but it could be a primordial black hole. So the reason it's likely that in this primordial black hole hypothesis there are lots of them in our galaxy is that the one in the middle the four million solar mass black hole assembled from mergers of small galaxies each containing black holes which all came together and merged together that's a very inefficient process so you, the best estimates are that at least as much mass is left outside as has merged together so there should be a large number no more than a few million solar masses worth in total of other black holes in the central few kiloparsecs of the galaxy. That, that's sort of a prediction. So, but it's not not a surprise they found this. To prove that's the explanation is another story. Yeah, yeah, back. Um, on the topic of uh, intermediate black holes, so if this is a valid candidate for a dark matter, what would it be? What would it take to you know put intermediate black holes at the front of? theory, like what, what experiment we have to do to prove that these are there or they are there. Okay, so one might be measuring this um, non-Gaussianity I talked about, because you need something weird about the fluctuations which would give you a large signal um, that one, um, you know, maybe would get from these futuristic experiments. So that, that, that's one definite way of pinning down the initial conditions that gave rise to the black holes. Uh, another way is they, um, they do merge together, they give you gravity waves, and if there's a wide range of masses, they give you a wide range of gravity wave signals. Not just the ones that LISA can see, uh, LIGO can see, has seen, but also the ones that LISA, which is the Space Gravity Wave Observatory, to be built in 2030 or thereabouts, 2034, which is, you know, three... Uh, three satellites sending um, laser beams to each other, etc. Or the pulsar timing array, which, um, so LISA will measure, um, what is it, million 
kilometer uh, type baselines, wavelengths essentially, frequencies, whereas the, the other experiment is uses pulsar timing arrays, and that measures frequencies of inverse tens of light years, even lower frequencies, and that, that also is a prediction. Certain mass black holes will produce waves there, so if you start seeing waves in all these places, then that might be an interesting prediction too. Yep. So, the the dark energy produces the expansion of the universe through having some negative energy density creating a negative pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and assumably the reason that solar systems and galaxies don't fly apart is because the gravitational attraction is greater than mm -hmm. expansionary yes. pressure. Is there a way to devise an experiment that could be performed on Earth to account for that and to see if there's effects of to essentially see the effects of dark energy? People have thought about that very hard. Um, you want a tabletop experiment to look for this very, very tiny deviation from gravity. Um, I don't know the current status. I don't think anyone has come with a, with a good idea yet. But in principle, you're right. There should be uh, uh, some signal. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so oh, one more question. Uh, why you said that like, dark matter gathers more density the central together? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so they interact with gravitational, right? So, how does gravitational wave of like, through dark matter compare to like, dark Okay, so the gravity waves are maybe not really affected by this, actually. They will just pass freely. Whatever the dark matter is, the gravity, is, is all that really matters is, is their formation in this intensely strong gravity field. When they pass through a weak field, uh, nothing changes. So... They travel like the same? Yes, same yes, that's right, 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 just like speed of light. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one more question. Um, do you know roughly the mass ranges probed by LIGO and LISA? Um, yeah, so um, LISA is good for um, 10 to 100, 1 to 100 cell mass black holes, and LISA is good for 100,000, that's the peak of their distribution, to 10 million cell masses black hole mergers. Okay, so good. Well. Thanks.